Good morning, good afternoon. Um, we'll just wait for a few more minutes um, to have a few more people join. Hello everyone, we're just waiting a couple of minutes to have a few more people join. All right, I guess we can start. Um, Quinton has uh, made his apologies. He's, he's tied up with something else. Um, okay, so um, as, a, as our first uh, topic on the agenda, we have two, two items on the agenda today. Uh, um, our first topic is uh, the Profiga project. Um, so, oh, hi, Luis. Um, Hello, guys. So, Proviga presented to us um, a few meetings ago. Um, I've put the YouTube recording um, in the list. Um, because Proviga presented to the SIG before um, they actually made an incubation proposal, um, we, uh, Amy has uh, said that they can skip the TOC triage step, so it can go straight to um, to the SIG uh, presentation or recommendation. Um, um, uh, my personal recommendation at this stage is that we we should recommend this to move to the to the TOC. Um, I'm asking for um, the SIG leads to uh, to to weigh in. Um, uh, or any of the other SIG chairs to 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 weigh in on the on the Proviga project. I think the the proposal that they've um, that they have put together is particularly strong. Um, so unless uh, 
uh, unless we have any you know specific objections uh, i'd recommend that we move this um uh, to the toc should we uh put some comments in the the prs or where are we capturing those for the toc are we going to put them in the doc i think we should well if, if if we want to move ahead yeah we should put some uh we should put a recommendation in, in the pr i imagine yeah okay I mean, I, I think it's strong. I think it should move on and I think it enhances the landscape. So I'm for it. I just wanted to know what, you know, our process was moving forward. All right. So, so we'll give it, um, so, so Derek, I'm not sure if you're on the call, but, um, we'll, yeah. we'll give it, we'll give it a, a couple of days just to, to get any more, um, feedback and then, and then make an official recommendation by the end of the week, if that works for you. Yeah, that sounds great. Really looking forward to it. Um, also, I did um, about two days ago, I added a comparison with Kafka to the proposal. So um, look for that. Alex, you recommended maybe also adding um, like provisional use cases from the website. Um, mm. The, the proposal is getting a little long. I don't know if we, we should add those, but I wanted to, if you guys have any other recommendations about the proposal, we're, um, we're certainly open to that um, as you guys finish your reviews. I I, th I think it looks I think it looks fine as is honestly there's 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 enough detail there and the comparison with Kafka is is really brilliant and that that must have taken quite a bit of um, research and work so we appreciate yeah. that thank you yeah a lot of reviews as well we wanted to be accurate so thank you and um, looking forward to this other presentation today awesome um, okay uh, did anybody else want to comment on Proviga before we move on. Um, so, so the next item on the agenda um, is, uh, and, and I expect this to take the, the majority of the rest of the call, um, is the uh, presentation of the Piraeus data store. I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so this is um, uh, this is a uh, Kubernetes uh, cloud native storage project that um, that builds on the DRDB um, project. Um, and I believe uh, Philippe is um, on the call and he's going to be presenting. Hello, Alex. Here's Philippe speaking. Um, Hello. I'm ready to go. Fantastic. Um, do you want to do you want to share your screen? Yes, I will do that. Okay. I assume my slides are visible. We can see it. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, then um, I will fly over the first half of this huge slide deck really quickly because I assume you guys are all very familiar with that. So the first part is about um, software building blocks on the Linux kernel. And they are all used with, with various data store. So this is why I have them here in the slide deck. So the first building block is LVM. And I'm pretty convinced all of you know what LVM does. Physical volumes into volume group. And out of that, we get LVs and snapshots has been around since must be like 13 years now, right? Then a few years later, um, it got the capability to uh, manage thinly allocated logic volumes. And that's this thin pool driver. So with that, um, a regular LV becomes a thin pool. And out of that, you can create thinly allocated logic volumes and snapshots of those. And those snapshots are really uh, efficient uh, if you take multiple snapshots from a single origin. Then what else is there? There is Linux RAID. Um, Linux software RAID provides all the RAID levels from uh, striping, mirroring, RAID 5, 6, uh, and so on, and it has even two front ends these days, but it goes to the same backend implementation in the kernel. 
then there are a number of implementations to use to block storage tiers where one is a cache for, other, for another one. Uh, the two major ones on the mainstream kernel are DM cache and bcache. Uh, they both serve about the same purpose. And there's a third one, I need to update my slide. The third one is called DM write cache. And DM write cache uh, was built with the purpose to put PMEM in front of, let's say, um, NVMe drives. Um, there is also deduplication on a few kernels <laughs> on all the rel 7.5 and later, also CentOS 7.5 and later kernels. Uh, where is that coming from? It's, or it's called VDO, Virtual Data Optimizer, and it's coming from an acquisition of Red Hat. And maybe one day, um, they managed to bring it to the upstream kernel. Right now, this is a rel or CentOS technology only. Then there are all sorts of targets and initiators. Um, so these days, the only relevant is the LIO, uh, which provides iSCSI and all, all its relatives. And the new kid on the block is NVMe or Fabrics. And we have a target and initiator implementation on the uh, upstream kernel and also arriving in the, in the recent distributions. And hey, yeah. And a I, question off the top of your head, do you know which kernel version um, supports the NVMe over fabrics now? Um, I don't have it top of my head, but the five some things will have the NVMe EO fabrics. And when we talk about the major distributions, I know it's it's in rel 8.1. Right. Maybe also an 8.0, but I'm not sure, top of my head. Thank you. Um, yeah, CFS on Linux is also worth mentioning it. Uh, it's not on the, on the upstream kernel, uh, but it ships with the Ubuntu distribution. So you find a number of Ubuntu users out there who prefer uh, CFS over other technologies, uh, over LVM or uh, LVM with thin provisioning. And it's not only a file system, it also has a complete replacement for LVM built in uh, that is capable of doing thin provisioning. And it also has its own uh, spin of the RAID idea called RAID C or RAID C. Um, and it also brings caching oh, to use SSDs as cache for slower storage tiers. Yeah, uh, and for what I am concerned, I will only look at the, let's say, volume management aspects of it. Uh, I don't care about the file system aspect of it. Yeah, and then um, here at Linbit, we are a lot focused uh, on, on DBD. So let me explain what that is in a few minutes. So when we look from a very, very high altitude, you can imagine it as being like a RAID 1 between a local block device and an initiator. And on another machine behind the target is a second copy of your data. That is just to give you an idea. Um, it is implemented as a, a device driver, like a virtual device driver for Linux. It provides you a block device, DevDVD something here, and DevDVD something there. And in the moment you open it or you mount it, it promotes to primary and starts to replicate everything you write to it. In the moment you unmount it, it demotes to secondary and you're free to mount it on the other side and the direction of the replication will be reversed in that moment. Um, it is a multi-volume technology. So you could have two virtual devices, DevDVD1, DevDVD2. 
um, uh, which are replicated in a consistent way. So that is usually used uh, when you have um, one application, let's say a database, using two block volumes with different uh, characteristics. Let's say you have an Oracle database and you have your uh, database logs on the fast NVMe drive and you have your table spaces on the slow drive. And if you mirrored uh, two volumes concurrently in, 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 in a, within a consistency group, then it makes sure that the writes are never reordered and the two volumes are always at this, let's call them same logical point in time on the replication target. Um, it's so far, my slides only had um, two nodes, but it is a multi-node technology. So you could mirror from one primary to two secondaries concurrently. And each of the replication links can be synchronous or it can be configured to be asynchronous and that can even be switched at runtime. Um, it supports a diskless mode. Um, and that means the primary, so that is the node where you're using your data, where you're accessing your data, it doesn't need to have a local replica of the data, but is also capable to ship the read requests. And in this case, where it has two nodes that actually have copies of the data, it will do a, a kind of a load balancing scheme between the two nodes uh, for read requests. And for write requests, it sends the write request to both nodes concurrently. Um, the application running here in the primary is of course shielded from any failures. So let's say this secondary goes away and there was a read request processed on this secondary and now it crashes, then the primary will reissue the read request to this node and deliver the data to the application. So the application is shielded from this error. Uh, when the node comes back, it's, gets, it is automatically reintegrated and gets a resync of the writes it missed in the meantime. Um, yeah, so you, so you can imagine it as um, the diskless primary as being an iSCSI initiator that has the luxury to be of being connected to two targets concurrently. Um, yeah, all, all that comes from a background of building high availability systems. And we have been working on that since uh, nearly 20 years now. And what we did recently is recently we optimized it in case our metadata is located on PMEM or NVDIMS, because then we have the luxury that we can update the data there in smaller units than full blocks. So like in cache line granularity is what you get then. And on the roadmap, we are planning to look into ratio coding, um, but this is still very, very deep work in progress. Um, okay, so far I told you about all these storage building blocks on Linux, including DBD and they can, uh, they can be combined as you need them. So you can use logic volume from LVM as backing devices for DVD. You can put a video DD application below the LVM, or you can slip a DMCrypt encryption between DVD and LVM and so on. So you com can combine them on the data plane as you need it. Um, the complicated part about that is that most of these things bring their own management tool. Um, and this is the point where LinStore comes to the picture. The idea of LinStore is um, that it builds on all of, 
on all those storage building blocks and it gives you like an unified API for it. Um, so it is a distributed application. You run on a bunch of generic nodes. The only uh, requirement is that these nodes run the Linux kernel. Um, and it can then fulfill your volume requests like you should in I need a new volume, it should be two-way replicated, it should be that size, and I also give it a name, and it can do that for you. And to the user, it exposes a REST API, and on top of that REST API, we have built various connectors. And one is for the Kubernetes world, and I will put a focus on that. And we also have connectors for OpenStack, Open Nebula, Proxmox, and XCPNG in the works. Um, yeah, then maybe let's look at an example. So in a hyper-converged architecture, um, I'm, I'm looking here at, let's say, six nodes uh, that have enough memory and CPU to run the workload. In case of Kubernetes, these are um, containers, uh, pods, of course. So please excuse that they are labeled VM here. And the node has also built-in storage devices. Now, if Linster gets a request for a new persistent volume, uh, and let's assume our policy here is that we want to have them two-way replicated in order to be to protect against failing one of those nodes. Then we try to place one replica on the same node as where the workload is running and we place the second replica somewhere else. So right now for the orange part and the black part, the layout is in the optimal state. And that gives us that every, all the read requests can be carried out locally, not touching the network at all giving best performance um, and reducing load on the network. Only for writes, we need to send something over the net. Now in case a VM gets live migrated or a pod is moved, um, the situation looks a little bit different. Now it is a three node DBD setup with a primary diskless here where the workload is running and two storage nodes. So now all the reads are also shipped over the network. Um, but it takes a single Linster command or a time triggered policy. And given we have enough available uh, storage space here, Linster can allocate here new logic volume, um, add it to the DVD uh, config, DBD will start to copy over all the blocks, resync or everything over. And when that is finished, um, Linster will remove the now redundant third copy, uh, redundant in, in the sense of, of the policy we are using here in this example. Um, so this, is a, this was a walkthrough by example for a hyper-converged architecture. Um, Linster can also deal with architecture where you have um, disaggregated storage nodes and compute nodes, your workload nodes. Now, I want to touch quickly on the software architecture of Linster. So it has, it comes with two main components. One is called the satellite. Um, the satellite could also be called Linster node agent. So it runs on all the nodes, either storage or workload nodes, and it is our agent there to execute local commands. Uh, it is, it doesn't uh, uh, have any local state, nor does it need any configuration. So just installing it and starting it. And in context of Kubernetes, it's simply a stateless container. Um, the controller is the central part. It establishes 
uh, connections to all its satellites uh, to do something useful. And in traditional Insta setups, the controller would be stateful. It has an embedded SQL database. In the context of Kubernetes, um, it can put everything into an etcd key value store. And then the controller itself is also stateless and can be easily be moved around. Um, I should mention here that this structure we are seeing on this slide is only the control structure. It has nothing to do with the data path. So the data path is um, DOBD and the data path is independent of that. So that means we can stop and start the satellites or the controller. We can even upgrade the controller and the satellites to complete Linster system. And all the existing volumes, all the existing persistent volumes that are in use continue to do IO while we can do that. Hey, hey Philip, um, sorry if um, you're gonna cover this in, in some later slides, but, but I was just wondering, how how are the um, how how are the control plane decisions made? Is it within the Linstor controller or the Linstor satellite, and is it centralized function somehow? Um, what do you mean by uh, um, control? No. So 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 for example, when when you get the request for a new volume, for example. Oh, yeah. Um, what what makes the decision on you know placement or or you know how to how to decide which which node it should live on and and, and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Now I got it. Yes. Um, that kind of decision is found in in the controller, and then the controller hands out the tasks to the satellites. Um, so, so, so is there is there sort of one controller that's a leader for the cluster, so to speak? Yes, there's only one active controller. So the the grayed out controllers here are just like standby positions. I see. Yeah, and that often leads to the question: What is the scalability of the system? Um, uh, currently, the biggest installation we have uh, operates with about 500 satellites and one controller. And so far, it behaves very smooth. Um, and we expect that this can scale to 1,000, 2,000 easily. OK, yeah. thank you. And the, the other things we see on the slide is, yeah, well, the, the REST API and then the, the, there is a little client uh, library and the CLI program, how you can inspect all the Lint store system. And uh, what kind of challenges uh, it can solve for you is, for example, data placement. So you could uh, it supports you that you can uh, tag your nodes with uh, chassis numbers, a room number, rack number, and then refer to these tags in your policy. And you could express a policy like um, always place replicas in different chassis, but in the same rack, things like that. And and uh, this, this placement policy uh, recently got a let's call it multidimensional um, thing. So it can take into, account, into consideration available storage space, um, all your constraints based on, on labels, uh, but also other metrics like um, available bandwidth on your NIC or available bandwidth to the backend storage. Um, literally arbitrary things you want uh, to take into account. That sounds that sounds extremely powerful. Is is um, are are those policies um, 
how are they exposed um, to to Kubernetes? Um, they are lint store objects, and from from Kubernetes, uh, you um, or in the Kubernetes world, you have a storage class, and the storage class maps one-to-one -to, -one to a so-called resource group in LinStore. And on the resource group, you express all these policy stuff. I see, um, okay. I'm not sure if at this point, every, every property of such a LinStore resource group can be, exp can be uh, uh, um, addressed through the uh, storage class YAML, but yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question, maybe you are going to cover this later. I was just wondering, since this uh, project is called a Pyreus data yeah. project, but I haven't seen a slide that shows Pyreus yet. So I'm just wondering if that's coming up later. I'm a little confused. <laughs> Yes, that? that's that's coming in two slides. Okay, I, I'm I'm right. sorry, um, because because so, so far it's it's not it's actually not Kubernetes specific up to this point, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, the the connectors, uh, Kubernetes and some others. Let's ignore the others. So for 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 Kubernetes. Um, uh, we joined forces with Dao Cloud um, because at, at Linbit, our main expertise is Linux and, and DVD and all very low level stuff. And Pireos, uh, and Dao Cloud helped us a lot to understand what's, what is actually necessary for the Kubernetes world. And so we began with, uh, con with packaging all these components into containers so we have now uh, module loader containers for DBD. Uh, we have uh, prepackaged containers of the satellite of the controller, and even now an operator. We started with deployment by YAML files, and yeah, and that is now starting to be deprecated by the operator. And yeah, and here comes in where, what is Perios Data Store? Perios Data Store is a packaging of, of LinStore and DBD, um, publicly available on Docker Hub Quay. Um, the development happens on GitHub. Um, yeah, and it has all those components. Um, then store controller satellite, the operator, etc. CSI drive, of course. <laughs> I for forgot to mention that, right? CSI driver. And uh, recently we finished the work on a Stork plugin. So Stork is, is a Kubernetes scheduler extension. Um, that allows you to collocate your workload with replicas uh, of your storage. So we are working with the Portworx people to get that uh, merged into Stork upstream. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much about it. Yeah. So here, this is my slide that reminds me how the mapping is. So a Kubernetes storage class is a LinStore resource group and uh, Kubernetes persistent volume is a resource with a th single volume on the LinStore level. Yeah, and then I have a case study and a summary slide here that tries to um, summarize hey, the scope of it. 
Philippe, yeah. just just a quick few questions. So, because I I, I feel like we 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 covered um, uh, a lot of the detail of what's happening in the data plane um, with Linstore um, and the DRDB Foundation. Um, but I'm 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 sort of still got a bit, I'm still a bit fuzzy, and maybe we haven't covered um, enough detail of sort of how this operates in in a cloud native world in terms of you know when when you're operating it's either hyper converged or or otherwise you know how does placement decisions happen how do failovers happen um what what does the csi integration kind of look like is is, is that something you have a bit more detail on perhaps um, I don't have slides on that, um, but maybe you can guide me a little bit with with questions. And I see that here on the call is also Moritz, and Moritz maybe can help me with answering a few of the questions. Uh, that's that, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, you know, we it was. Um, it was a pretty uh, sort of quick turnaround between asking for a presentation and actually presenting. So, I, you know, it's fine if you don't have everything on, on a slide, but I, I was wondering if you could go into a, a little bit more detail on um, some of the Kubernetes integration aspects. So, you know, you mentioned that there is, um, you mentioned that there is a, a controller, but what, what does what does the controller do in terms of the satellite? Does it configure LVM and set up the RBD connections? And how does it manage, you know, for example, a, a, a node failing or, or or something like that? Is it is it is is, is that logic part of the controller or, or is that something else? Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, the, the controller and so the Linster controller um, that has uh, the the database, the overview of what what is the cluster, you know, all the nodes, all the volumes, all, all these objects, um, and that's still not Kubernetes specific, right? So the the Linster controller would be the same if it is used in another environment. Right. And um, the Kubernetes specific parts, well, the, the CSI driver, right? Uh, so it's every, all the control is through the CSI driver. Uh, do you have other, um, other operator that communicate with Kubernetes directly or is it all through the CSI driver. It sounds like it's Torque and CSI driver, right? Okay, so it's all going using basically using the 3D class and decide what is the resource group to use, and then then everything happened uh, that's controlled by the resource group, whatever how, uh, however that is configured. No, I meant like uh, I think it's Stork. And the CSI driver, the interface. Oh, Stork. Like okay. Sure. Okay. So, okay. Stork is a scheduler, right? Scheduler. Stork um, is uh, not just a extension scheduler. It also deals with snapshots and group snapshots, uh, movement of data. Okay. It, it deals with all the uh, uh, data lifecycle services that Kubernetes does not. So. Okay. So there's a, there could be a lot of, I, I, well, I guess what we're asking is we don't know the interaction between this project and the cloud native services that Kubernetes provides. I guess that's the question, right? Yeah, it's not clear because uh, I've just, that's what I was saying, that I see the uh, barriers, but I don't, don't see too much about it. I mean, the slides and I went there uh, to look, and it looks like there's an operator. Um, 
Um, yeah, not 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 quite clear to me how. So, this so is I think for. yeah, totally. I think the question is what is being presented and what is what is the uh, request to include in CNCF? What mm -hmm. project? Right. Yeah. It seems okay. like it's the Pyrus. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. Sorry. How do you, how do you pronounce that? I, I, I say uh, Pyrus, but oh, Pyrus. Okay. All right. That that, yeah. might, that might be from my German language background. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Uh, what uh, what we bundle under Perios is the CSI driver, um, the operator, um, yeah, also the the YAML files, the Helm charts, um, and well, the, the stock bits. But I think st stock is. Well, is, is stock related to the CNCF? I am not, not yet. Much. No, not, not yet. Yeah. No. And uh, we also have plans to build a failover controller. And that is also very Kubernetes specific. And so that is yeah. also going into this uh, Perios project. Okay. So it sounds like we need to understand more what this operator does. Mm -hmm. Um, so, hello. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. This uh, this is Alex Jen from Dark Cloud, uh, uh, which are helping um, Limbit to do the Pareos project. Uh, is it okay for me to add something so to make it more clear about the project scope? Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Phil. Sorry, Phil. I have. Yeah, I, I think we can give you a hand on this one. Uh, may I may I share the uh, uh, screen for, for, for two slides. Yes, no problem. Okay. Uh, one second. Uh, <clears throat> Alex, oh, I, I can share it. I have it here ready. Yeah, please, please, tips. please share the screen for the uh, two slides I sent you today. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, uh, what a Xing, uh, what Mrs. Yang or Mr. Xing is asking about is it the difference between Pareos and the link store. And, um, and this slide is about it. So generally links, um, this is a stack similar to what you see from Rook plus Ceph plus Nuba sort of. So here um, the Pareos does is, uh, is uh, for the containerization and orchestration of the uh, link store components. Okay, uh, now it's, do, it's done by operator and also have the CS driver, and also will contain um, some like a fa failover fencing for RWO volumes, and also the, uh, 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 the connection to the uh, stork scheduler. So all the Kubernetes components will be inside the Perea's project. Um, but link store is actually the storage system that uh, does the clustering, um, volume lifecycle management means a create, delete volume, and also resize volume, and volume monitoring is all done by link store. And DRBD here is for the uh, um, block replic replications. Okay, this is this uh this is a stack. So, um, say the control flow, the backend control flow is in link store. The data path is in DRBD plus the LVM volume underneath DRBD, and all the all the control front end control that um, that uh, um, operates with Kubernetes are within Perios. So this is a a stack. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, how, so generally, what we want to do is to want to contribute in the uh, this three stack into the Linux. Linux um, actually, the DRBD is already uh, within the Linux kernel. So and uh, and the link store, I think, is in discussion of entering Soda, and we want to give Perios to to Cloud Native Foundation. So, okay, I think that, I've, at least from my point of view, I would like to see more of what the architecture of of Perios is and how it interacts with with Kubernetes and as a whole. Uh, I think that's what's missing here. Is it, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, uh, I, I I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I I, I yeah. think I think we I think we need um, we need some you know 
basic structure to kind of say, look, when you when you use the Perius operator, for example, it it implements the Linstore controller and the Linstore satellites, for example, and then when you know a, a, a volume is uh, a, a, a PVC or, or, or a volume request is uh, is issued. Um, what process does Perius um, implement? And 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 also, you know, if if you're making the comparison with Rook, I'd like to kind of understand, sort of. Yeah, I think uh, Perius. Yeah, I think Perius is most close to the concept of Rook. Actually, it's a collection of of, of the uh, uh, storage operators, user driver, and also other like scheduler things that makes a uh, story system like Linstore cloud native. Okay, this is it's a Perius scope. And the Linstore is actual, the actual story system. Again, the DRBD is underlying data pass technology. And, 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 and that's fine, but, but I'd like to understand sort of the, what does the Perius operator actually manage or, or what are the plans for it? Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Uh, Maybe, maybe I can give it a little bit of you. And, and, um, so, uh, whoever is talking is really hard to understand. Yeah. The mm -hmm. microphone is talking and stuff. If, if, if that was Moritz, you, you have a serious I, I, audio problem. I suspect. Like this was yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that's a pity that <laughs> Moritz audio is not working because M Moritz is now uh, work the the main guy behind the Perius operator, so he could give most insights from top of his head. Um, that's okay. So, so, so that's that. That's all right. I mean, if um, it 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 sounds it sounds like um, we uh, it it sounds like you know maybe you need to um, prepare a little bit more background on the on the Perius um, uh, operator uh, and the Perius functionality specifically. I, I I think you know we we got a good understanding um, of. Sort of Linstore and DRDB, which 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 is you know great, and and thank you for that. Um, but I think I think we we, we didn't quite understand um, the functionality of Perius and 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 what you're you're planning on 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 building with 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 Perius. So 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 perhaps um, if you want to sort of maybe discuss that, that 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 would be the most helpful. And if if you're not prepared today, that's fine as well. We can always schedule it in for a yeah. for a, a future date. Um, Alex, um, l let me try to answer that from the top of my head as good as I can. Um, and I, I also shared the, the web page where it is on GitHub. And so it gives here a walkthrough. Um, but let me try to summarize that in my, in my words. Um, so the, the purpose of the Perius operator is to, to, to run uh, the Linster controller in containers um, if, if requested, if necessary, it will run the DVD module loader containers on your cluster. Um, if requested, it will run um, etcd in your Kubernetes environment and point the Linster controller to that etcd instance. And it will also get the CSI driver and the CSI components in place. Um, if requested, it can also do um, detection of local storage devices and of unused local storage devices and turn them into uh, Linstore storage pools uh, automatically. And, and I think it can also 
if requested, it can also uh, bring the stork scheduler extension into the cluster. So from top of my head, that is what it does. Okay. I I I think that's I think that's helpful to to um to set the scene, but um I I suspect um it would be it would be helpful to get um you know a, a presentation on, on Perius specifically. Um it, it, perhaps at a future date. Um mm -hmm. you know we can we can do this in the next meeting. Um, can I can I just quickly ask? Um, is the intention to apply for um, a sandbox, or is it for um, or or are you looking to 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 possibly apply for incubation? Uh, let's take it step by step. So the first goal is to get it into the sandbox, um, and maybe further, but you know, step by step. Okay, no, that's 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 fine. Um, in in that case, what 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 I would recommend, you know, it, it's possible, obviously, to to make a sandbox application um, um, to the to the TOC directly. But I sort of strongly recommend that that we can maybe structure the presentation slightly more uh, thoroughly so that we can get a better understanding of what of what. Perius is going to cover and what maybe some of the plans are for Perius because I, I think there's there's a bit of a gap of understanding um, with the team. Mm -hmm. So so that would be useful for, for the next steps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we will uh, tr assemble a, a presentation with with that in focus. And uh, when ready, I will shoot a mail on the SIG mailing list and ask for for some time in one of the meetings. That would be that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the stage. You're very welcome, and we look forward to uh, to hearing further details in future. Um, does anybody have any other? questions or, or comments that they would like to raise at this point. Otherwise, I think we can give everybody a few minutes back. I don't have anything. Thanks, everyone. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.